Um, go ahead and grab your Bibles and open them up to the book of Esther. Esther chapter 6 is where we find ourselves this morning. Um, if you do not have a Bible, then there are some here near the front, and there's also some back here by the uh, sound booth. Make sure you grab a Bible. You need one of those. The book of Esther chapter 6 as we continue to make our way through. My Bible lost Esther. I don't know where it went. There it is. All right. So today, this morning, as we look into Esther chapter 6, we're going to be um, kind of in a transition period in the book of Esther. Uh, this is where things have been building, and now they all kind of come together in chapter 6 and 7 of the book of Esther. Uh, and, and just looking at this, really the, the big thing that we're going to be seeing is that God's timing is always perfect. He has impeccable, perfect timing. Um, have you ever had a, a time where you wonder why things didn't work out? That, that you were sure things were going to go a certain direction. That you were sure something was going to happen. You were absolutely certain that it that was going to work out this way and it should have worked out that way. It should have gone uh, the way that you thought it should and yet it just didn't. Things just kind of happened differently. And a lot of times you're left wondering what in the world took place uh, how did this not come to come about the way that it, uh, I thought it should? And, and there are times when this can be frustrating because you're left with a lot more questions than you have answers. That, that you're just you're left with uncertainty about why or you're not sure how. Um, and, and so there's just a, a bunch of questions rattling around in your mind that you don't really have categories for. You don't really have positions for them. And, and in that, sometimes because there's no answers, there's no clear way forward. And so it's just a frustrating situation to be in from time to time. And, and here in Esther chapter 6, we kind of see those things all come together because every once in a while, God pulls back the veil and he lets you see what he's been doing. That time passes, things take place, and, and sometimes, as they, the, the saying goes, uh, 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 oh man, the saying popped out of my head. Apparently it's not a great saying. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. There it is. <laughs> I just needed a second to think. <laughs> hindsight's twenty twenty, right? You look back, in the moment, you're, you're unsure, you're uncertain. It, it feels like chaos. It feels like God's out of control. It feels like God abandoned me. Could, God, can't you see this? Don't you know? Don't you care? And you're going through it, and then you come to the other side, and some time passes. Sometimes years go by. And then, and then clarity comes. And you're able to look back and say, oh, of course God did it that way. Of course God allowed this to come into my life. Of course it happened this way. I couldn't see it then, but I absolutely see it now. And that's exactly where we find ourselves in Esther chapter 6 today. That these moments remind us that God is sovereign, that he is good, that he is kind, and that he is involved in the affairs of human life. That's exactly what's taking place here. And so as we look at Esther chapter 6, we sort of get a behind-the-veil look at how God's hand in providence is clearly seen in supernaturally orchestrating the events of human life. All right, so here's our big idea in Esther chapter 6 as we take a look at this to get together, uh, excuse me, together today. It's this, if my God is for me, who can be against me? If my God is for me, who can be against me? And so this week, as we take a look at this, we're going to look at it in three parts, all right? Uh, chapter 6 is going to be broken down into three pieces. Verses 1 through 3, God's plan. Verses 4 through 9, man's plan. And then verses 10 through 14, God's glory. Now, if you remember back, just by way of kind of catching us all up to speed, Esther, uh, the first few chapters, um, they go over a, a span of about nine years of time. Esther 1 and 2, by the time you get to the beginning of chapter 3, you're, you've passed about nine years of time. It kind of, it's like a rock skipping across a lake. It just hits the high points and kind of is moving the story along. But then, 
as we see here where we're at uh, from chapter 3 all the way through the end of chapter 8, it slows down to look at about a week's worth of time, a little bit more than a week worth of time. So we're really focusing in on a very specific point and season of time here in Esther uh, chapter, si- chapter 6. We're right in the middle of that. And we see in chapters 1 and 2 that um, the, the king is trying to uh, promote himself and he's trying to go out and do his thing and uh, he's gathering a bunch of people together in order to uh, let them know how awesome he is and he throws this huge party uh, for six months of time. And at the end of that party, he ends up abandoning his wife and uh, he basically divorces her and casts her into exile because she just didn't listen to him uh, where she, he wanted to show her off as this trophy wife to his buddies. And she said no. And so he got rid of her. And so then uh, after some time passes, they decide, hey, let's, uh, the king's kind of feeling down now that he's thinking about how he abandoned his wife. Uh, let's, let's throw a beauty contest for everybody. You know, let's not replace the queen with, with one woman. Let's replace the queen with every woman. And so they gather all the women together and, and God providentially places Esther in the position of being the queen. But then in the middle of this, we see that there's this plot that comes about where an evil man rises to power named Haman, not human, Haman, uh, and uh, he is, uh, he's given this position of authority and power, and he wants to use his authority and use his power for his own glory. And when people won't give him the glory that he believes he's due, he wants to take them out. And Mordecai is one such man. Esther's adopted father, uh, that he is uh, not able, he is not willing to bow down to Haman. He's not willing to glorify him in that way. And so Haman decides, I'm going to take out not just Mordecai, but every Jew there is. And then, like we said before, that is upwards of 10 million, perhaps more, uh, in this season. And so the, the people's lives are all on the line. And, and Mordecai, as we look back at chapter 4, convinces Esther uh, and says, hey, you, you have an opportunity to do something. And, and he says the, that epic line, you, that you, who knows if God has placed you there for such a time as this. Who knows if this is not the very reason why God has placed you as queen in the first place. And so she works up the courage to say, let's go and talk to the king. And that's where we were at last week and going and talking to the king. And she throws a barbecue. Uh, But in the middle of the barbecue, she decides, you know what? It's not the right time. I need to to wait on this. And instead of pressing forward in this, I need to just wait on the things of the Lord. And so as we see that, what we're going to be looking at is that every detail of Esther has been building to these next two chapters. To chapter 6 where we're at today and chapter 7 where we're going to be at next week. Everything has been building to this. This is where the, the climax of the narrative all comes together. And today my prayer is that as we look at this, that we take some time to look at Esther chapter 6, that you will be able to clearly see God's glory and God's character on brilliant display, and that He truly is involved in the events of life. You may not be able to clearly see it all the time. You may not, in the middle of it, you, God may seem like He's just not there, but He actually is involved, and we can trust in and hope in and rely on that. So let's let's jump in and read uh, Esther chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 together, and we'll break that down. (coughs) Excuse me. Esther 6, 1, it says, That night the king could not sleep, so one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king... You guys looking for boy names? Those are really cool names. Um, Two of the king's eunuchs... Uh, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the, and the king's servants who, read, oh, excuse me, who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. In, here in, in uh, the opening verses of chapter 6, we see that uh, Esther has just thrown a barbecue uh, for the king and his buddy, complete with smoked tri-tip and hot wings and oatmeal raisin cookies and ice cold Coke. Or maybe that's just me. Um, she's, right, she throws this barbecue for him, and she's doing so as a way to approach him 
in a certain frame of mind. Uh, it's, it's like the way that my wife treats me when she's trying to get something, right? She knows if I just go, hey, can I spend some money? I'm probably going to go, no, we don't know. And, but if she approaches me a certain way with maybe a plate of hot wings and says, oh, you've been working so hard. <laughs> she's working him, right? She's working the angles. She's wise. She knows exactly what she's doing. But in the middle of this barbecue, she just, she kind of senses that there's not permission from the Lord to move forward and make her request. And so she waits. And we made mention last week that, that her waiting was not cowardice, but it was actually faithful obedience. That she wasn't, she wasn't stopping because she just wasn't sure, but that she's actually moving forward faithful before the Lord. And that this waiting by Esther is a beginning of a series of it just so happens. It just so happens that Esther didn't ask for anything. It just so happens that Haman goes home that night and makes plans to take out Mordecai. It just so happens. And as we see this, that this series of it just so happens carries us all the way through the end of chapter 7 where Haman is dealt with. And, and, and in this, what we've got to see, what we've got to realize is that where we as people tend to put the, the words it just so happens or it happened to work out or uh, um, I can't believe it, it just took place that those need to be replaced with the proper theology of God is at work. God is providentially orchestrating the, the affairs of life. For the Christian, there is no, it just so happens. We may say that, but what we need to understand is that God is moving. All right? So as we look at this and as we see these, these things taking place, we can't miss the hand of God moving so clearly in all of this. That there's no luck here. That it's God's providential intervention. And many times when we look at God, look for God at work in our lives, I don't know about you, but I know for me, what I'm looking for is the heavens to part, the, the light to shine down, the angels to sing, God to audibly speak in my ears, or maybe even an angel shows up and says, hey, do this. I mean, I read about that in scripture, right? Why doesn't that hap happen for me? And many times that's not the way that God moves. Sure, there are times when there are supernatural, crazy things that, that just take place in life. Yes, God does move that way. But by and large, as you read through Scripture, as you look at the, uh, the actual working out of God and how He deals with people, it's, it's really supernaturally natural. A lot of it is, is stuff that you could just explain away. A lot of it is stuff that if you didn't look at it from the eyes of faith, if you didn't take at it from a spiritual perspective, you could say, it just so happened. You could look at all of these chain of events and say, man, that is crazy that all of those things just happened, that the dominoes just happened to be set up so perfectly, but, but not for the Christian. We look at these things and we say, no, God is setting things in order because he's bringing about a very specific purpose. And so as we look at this and we read here in verse, verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, that night. So what night is that? That's the night when Esther had the first barbecue. She's going to have another barbecue the next night. I'm saying barbecue, but it says feast, okay? I'm just saying that for <laughs> culture reference, all right? Okay, so that, so, right, you get that? It doesn't say barbecue in the Bible? All right, so, so you got those happening on one night and then the next night. The night between, right? So they have that barbecue the first night. The king goes to bed and he's, he just... He's having a sleepless night. This king that has all this authority, all this power, all this ability, he's the, he's the ruler over the largest human empire up to this point in human history. He's got control over everything, but he can't control his own sleep. And there he is, sleepless, laying in his bed, waiting to see what's going to take place. And Xerxes is not able to sleep on this particular night. It just so happens. And it just so happens that he, look, he could not sleep. So, verse 6, verse 1, so one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. So the king decides, hey, I, I can't sleep, I can't rest, I'm restless, 
Um, and I believe that it's not really clearly stated when this took place, uh, but based on the context of the next section we're going to read, it seems to me that it's more uh, the early morning hours that he went to bed, he was awoken in the middle of the night and just couldn't go back to sleep. And so you guys ever have that happen where you're just up in the middle of the night and you're, you're like, I just can't go to sleep. I, I know that happens to me every once in a while. And I think a lot of times what I end up doing is I just sit there frustrated and angry. Um, and, uh, and, and as I read this and I see what God is doing in the middle of this, I see maybe sometimes that's from God. Maybe God's actually doing something. And instead of being frustrated and angry, maybe I should reach for the book. Maybe instead of just letting, letting this time pass, maybe I should go for the book. Maybe I should spend some time in prayer. Maybe I should get up and seek the Lord in those moments instead of just lay there frustrated and worrying over whatever that thing is and that's occupying my heart and mind or whatever, whatever uh, maybe it's not even something that's got me so stressed out. It's just random. Maybe it's the Lord. Maybe God is actually doing this because here we see God has clearly got him up. Now, here's something that's weird. You notice what he asks for? He asks for the chronicles of, so the, the chronicles means the history of his kingdom. He says, I can't sleep. Someone go get the history book and just start reading to me. Because if there's anything that's going to put you to sleep, it's just reading some dry history. This happened and this happened. And yes, that's going to do it. Get it, boys. Right? And so he asked some guy to bring in and, and do that. It's, just, it's kind of weird. Now, now place yourself in the position of the king. I mean, I, we read in here, this guy's got a lot of options, right? He's king. Uh, he's, he's got the most powerful empire in human history. We read in here, he's got a massive harem. He doesn't call for any of the women. He did, he's got all of these people who could come and entertain him. He doesn't call for any of those. Um, he's, not, he's not, you know, turning on the TV. Well, he doesn't have one, but you know what I mean? Like he's not looking for entertainment. He's not looking for uh, something, uh, something else. He happens, just so happens that the king says, hey, go get the, go get the book of the, of the history. And it just so happens that the guy that grabs the, the right scroll grabs the exact one that he should grab. Of all the different things that he could have grabbed, he walks into the vault and he grabs that one. The one that has Mordecai's history in it. That tells of something that happened five years ago. Remember that in chapter two, at the end of chapter two? That was five years ago from this time. And that he just so happens to grab that. And it just so happens that they read about Mordecai. I mean, they could have read about all, a whole bunch of different things, but it just so happens that they read about Mordecai in this moment. And it just so happens that the king never gave him a reward for what he did. Do you see how all of these things are working together? And what we're going to see as we continue on is it just so happens that Haman enters the courtyard at the exact moment when the king is thinking about Mordecai. There are so many intricate, tiny details, hundreds and hundreds of decisions that are made that are all directed and orchestrated by God. They all seem normal. They all seem natural. There's nothing that's this hand of God that, you know, grabbed the guy and said, don't grab that scroll, grab this one. You know, that, it's not the way that it worked out. It was very natural. These people were just doing their normal things. And yet God was orchestrating every single detail. God is at work in your life. God is moving. You may not be able to see it. You may not be able to detect it. You may look at it and say, I'm not sure anything's taking place. Or maybe, I, maybe God's just playing a mean joke on me today. But that's not true because that's not, that's not in line with the character and nature of who our God is. And so we see that the king does this and he's reading about this and he asks about Mordecai. And this is kind of kind of interesting in all of this that Mordecai has literally saved the king's life and he absolutely deserves a reward, but he was never recognized. Do you remember when this took place that there's these two guys, Big Thana and Teresh, that they had this, they, they were the guys that were the doorkeepers of the king's chambers when he slept. And, and these guys were plotting an assassination attempt. And Mordecai just so happened to overhear it and turns these guys in. Well, in the middle of dealing with all of this, the king executes these guys and then moves on in life, but he never recognizes Haman for this. Now, in this culture, uh, the way, one of the ways, uh, especially a, a lot of these ancient cultures, one of the ways that power was uh, consolidated was by a series of rewards and punishments. If you cross the king, you get a big a really big splinter, like we saw these guys got. If you don't cross the king, if you serve the king, then he is going to reward you like crazy so that he can buy people's affections. 
And, and we read this and we look, Mordecai wasn't, he was never recognized. This is a massive, massive oversight for the king. This is a vulnerability for him. This is something that should have taken place and yet it did not. I mean, put yourself in Mordecai's shoes. I mean, Mordecai could have felt, maybe he did, felt really unfairly treated. Man, I put myself out there. I took care of you. I had your back. I did everything right. And you didn't even, you didn't even say thanks. Nothing? I mean, you didn't even send a fruit basket? Like, what the heck, man? Uh, just, uh, you didn't even say, just go away and die. Like, you, you didn't even recognize anything. It's just nuts what's taking place here. And in this, he, he feels unfairly treated, I'm sure, um, and unsatisfied and unfulfilled in this. As I, as I look at that, that, that's the way that Mordecai could have felt. I mean, God, don't you care? Don't you see what's happening? Lord, you, your word says that the heart of the king is in your hands. You could have directed him to do something, but you didn't. Gosh, I'm just passed over. I'm just overlooked, and, and I'm just not getting what I thought I should. And, and for me, many times when I feel unfulfilled, Many times when I feel unsatisfied, when I look at those seasons of my life and I see this unfulfilled, unsatisfied thing, it's, it's not because of God's lack, but it's because of my pride. When I look at it, the reason I feel unfulfilled, the reason I feel unsatisfied is because I deserve blank. And I didn't get that. And because I'm so awesome and I love me and you should love me too. Have I told you about me? I'm really great. I want you to just, but I believe the world revolves around me. And because I do, I believe your world revolves around me as well. And so when I don't get what I should get, when I don't get what I deserve, when, when stuff doesn't work out in my favor, then I start to feel unfulfilled. Then I start to feel unsatisfied. And the reason is because I'm living for my glory. It has nothing to do with God. It has absolutely nothing to do with, with God not coming through, not taking care of me. Somehow God is not that good. That, that the, the scriptures say there's no shadow of turning in God, meaning that he is so pure and holy and good and righteous that there isn't even the hint of darkness within him. And I can agree with that theologically, but then in my heart, somehow I wrestle with it. And I think, yeah, but maybe, maybe you really are more like me than I think, God. Maybe you will fail me the way that they failed me. Maybe you will treat me the way they did. Maybe you are the way that I am and how I've failed other people. And we start to project all of, all of our human fallenness upon the holiness of God and judge him unfairly for that. Because it really has nothing to do with him. It has everything to do with me. Because of my pride, I think I deserve something. And that, that as I strive for gaining and obtaining or achieving... I'm doing it for my glory, and that's why I'm not satisfied, because I'm doing it for my glory. God won't share his glory. God won't share his glory. 1 Corinthians 1.29 um, says this. I'll, I'll put it on the screen for you. But in, in the middle of this, so this is a really short verse. And uh, so contextually, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking about the way that God works and moves. It says God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. God does, God does things that don't make sense in our human terms, that we can't quantify. Why? Because, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That, that this is why God does this. He does not share his glory. And when you are moving and working and organizing life for your glory, there are many times when that stuff doesn't work out. Not because God doesn't love you and not because God doesn't care about you, but because he cares about you so much that he will not share his glory with you. No flesh should glory in his presence. You see, when God's glory is your goal, then your soul is satisfied with him and completely content with whatever he chooses. But, conversely true, when your glory is your goal, nothing brings peace. Nothing fulfills. Nothing satisfies your desire. No matter how much you get. No matter how big your pile gets, no matter how much you're able to obtain, no matter how much achievement you're able to amass to yourself, no matter how many uh, little you know, uh, letters are after your name and how uh, learn, learned you are or wealthy you are, no amount of gaining and achieving and amassing will ever satisfy because it's for your glory. 
And so once we shift our attention, then all of the things that happen in life and, and all of our achieving isn't for our glory, it's for God's glory. And then it has this sweet spot of fulfillment and goodness. You see, the moment here, uh, directing our attention back to verse 3, the moment that the king said, uh, that it says that the king realizes that Mordecai did not receive a reward, that's the moment we clearly see why Esther didn't make the petition at the first barbecue. God is setting some stuff up. God's putting some things in order. And Esther was, was waiting, and her waiting was not cowardice. It was faithful obedience. That, that Mordecai getting passed over and not receiving anything for the good he did is all part of God's timing. It's all God, part of God's plan. Because here what we're going to see is that God is setting this up, and he's going to use this in the future. Now think of Mordecai. He had every right to go to the king and say, King, I saved your life. You owe me, bro. You owe me. What are you going to do for me? And the king would have said, you're, you're totally right. I'll, I'm going to give you something. And whatever it would have happened, whatever he would have done, whatever he would have given, would have far, far fallen short of the amazing glory of God in this moment. That God is about to use this for something that no one could have ever planned. That he would have circumvented this miraculous event by seeking out his own stuff. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. What if God really is as good as he says he is? I mean, what if, what if not just I just agree with that theologically because I've been at church longer than a couple of months and I realize God is good and, and I can see that there's verses for that. But what if I really believe God is actually as good as he says he is? What if I really believe that God is light and there is no shadow of turning? What if I really believe that he's a dad and he's a good dad and he loves his kids? What if I actually rest in that and hope in that? What if you can trust God? What if you really can trust him to work out the details? What if he's working in your life in ways that you cannot yet comprehend? And that you're striving for trying to get whatever you think you're owed is actually working against what God's setting up for your good, for his glory. Let's look ahead at verses 4 through 9 and take a look at this. Not only do we see God's plans, but we see man's plans in verses 4 through 9. It says, verse 4, so the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that uh, he had prepared for him. Again, that word gallows does not mean gallows in the way we would think of it in an old West movie uh, of uh, someone being hanged by the neck. Uh, this is somebody being hanged by a pike driven through their whole body. And so he just made this gallows uh, for Mordecai and he's coming into the king's court to say, hey king, I got a good idea. Let's, uh, oh, excuse me, Haman made that. And he's coming into the court saying, hey, I got a great idea, king. Let's kill Mordecai. And so this is what's taking place. Verse 5, the king's servants said to him, Haman is there, standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, who would the king like to honor more than me? I love me. Why don't you love me? Verse 7, and Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought out which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, and uh, which has a royal crest placed on the horse's head. And then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then... Parade him on horseback throughout the city, the city square, and proclaim before him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Haman here is, he's got this opportunity, and he sees, here's a chance for me to finally get all the glory that is due my name. I am so awesome. Why wouldn't anybody want to do this? You see, just the night before in verses five, chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, Haman's plotting all this out. He's scheming all this stuff up and saying, I've got to take out Mordecai. This guy's driving me crazy. I need to see him dead. And so he recounts all of his prosperity to his family and friends, his promotion and how everything is going his way. And he's preaching his own glory. And though he's proud and arrogant, Haman's absolutely right. Everything has been working out for him. Everything's going his way. Everything is really, really good for him. 
And this gives him a boldness to go ask the king for anything he wants because he figures he's going to get it. Of course I'm going to get it. The king gave me his signet ring. I can make whatever rule I want. I just need to go in and say, hey, this guy, he's a bad guy. Let's take him out. And the king's going to say, okay, uh, because I'm able to do that. And so he's, he's built this pike in his front yard that he wants to stab Mordecai on. Uh, we see in verse, uh, chapter 7, we'll get to that next week, verse 9, that he actually built it in his yard. And he wants to hang Mordecai on that. And so he shows up early at the palace to get the formality of permission dealt with before the king. He's got all of these schemes and plans and plotting, and he's going to take out Mordecai. But God is in control. But God is able to take what those plans are for evil and turn them to good. Notice what it says in Psalm 37, verse 7. It says, Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. There's a call to faith in this. People, the wicked people are going to scheme wicked stuff. They're going to. That's just the way it is. But you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to fret about it. You don't need to stress about it. You don't need to try to figure out how to work out the situation. What this calls us to is to wait and be still in the presence of God and let Him work it out. You worry about honoring God. You worry about bringing glory to His name. You worry about doing what God has put before you for today and let Him worry about all those other evil schemes. It's up to God to deal with those things. Now, verse 6, we see that Haman comes in and he's got all this, he's got all this uh, excitement uh, uh, and frustration and anger built up toward Mordecai. And he's got this question he wants to ask the king. But before he's able to ask his question, Xerxes has a question for him. And this unexpected question we see in verse 6 that, that uh, the king asks Haman, what do you think should be done for the person whom the king likes to, would like to, to honor? It, it kind of causes Haman's brain to short out. You know, I kind of see him almost stop for a second and, you know, uh, he's coming in with all this hatred and anger and vileness. And then all of a sudden he thinks, wait, who else would, would the king want to honor but me? Yes. What a great opportunity. This is amazing. Okay. What have I always wanted? And he lists out a bunch of things. And in this list, he says, I want there to be a royal robe that the king has worn. I want there to be a horse that the king has ridden on. And I want this crest or crown. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, when the, the presidential seal is on the motorcade, it represents that the president is there. Uh, very similar to that on the horse. Essentially, what he's saying is, I want to play king for the day. I want everyone to see me with the glory and honor that you have, king. And so I want you to to array whoever that person is in that best apparel, in that best uh, uh, opportunity. Now, it's kind of interesting that Haman's the guy that happens to be there, right? The king says, who's in the court? And Haman's the guy that happens to be there. Now, if, if this had been, let's say Haman slept in that day, if it happened to be someone else that was in the court, then maybe they would have had a different response. Maybe they would have had a, a different uh, uh, thing to take place. Maybe they would have had some questions. Well, who is the person that you want to honor? That's a a good question, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and maybe they would have done this, but no. H Haman is so blinded by his pride, by his arrogance, and by what he deserves, that he just sees opportunity. Oh, this is my chance. I can finally, I can finally get all the glory that is due my name. He's so self-absorbed that the, his only thought is, I love to bless me. Who else would love, who else would Xerxes love to bless but me? I, I really am that awesome. I, I love movies. I don't know if you love movies, but I just, I love movies. Uh, I'll, I'll watch pretty much any of them except a chick flip. Um, sometimes I'll suffer through those because I love my wife. But, you know, I, I just, I love movies. Especially the movies when there's a clear battle between good and evil. I just love those kinds of movies. When it's not clear, I get frustrated with those movies. When, like, the bad guy is doing stuff and it's good. I'm like, ah, but he's bad. Like, I just can't deal with that. So I have a hard time with that. But when there's a clear line between good and evil, that's what I, I love. 
And, and then when the hero is able to overcome impossible odds and take out the bad guy, and then you're like, yeah, it's so amazing. How did he do all that? It's so good. I just, I love those movies. And I think there's something within us that resounds with those movies uh, because really it's, it's, ta- it's speaking to us about who God is, about how great he is, and about how Jesus is the hero. But, but in that, one of the reasons that I, I like those movies is because uh, in that, I put myself in the hero's position. This is kind of, this is some behind the veil into my little heart, right? So I put, my, I put myself into the hero's position and I think, of course, I would make all of the noble sacrifices. I, I'm, yes. Yes, I would, I would plan things out perfectly. I, I would do what is honorable. I'd make all the wise moves and of course I could take out 15 guys at once. Um, like, yeah, I, I put myself in their position, in their shoes. And that's one of the reasons why I like it. In my mind, I build myself up as the hero. But the truth is, the truth is I'm really actually the villain. As we read this, we look at Haman and, we, and it's easy for us to go, man, what a, what a scumbag. What a dirtbag. He's going in there and he's just proclaiming his own glory. And we look at that and say, that's terrible. But in truth, if I'm honest, that's me. That's what I want to do. I want to build myself up. I want my glory to be seen. I, I want the opportunities I want everything to work out my way. I don't ever want to have stuff go wrong. I don't want to ever have a bad day. I always want things to be good and right and perfect. I always want blessing and prosperity to follow me everywhere I go. And in this, the truth is that even though I want to believe that I'm the hero, no, there's only one hero. His name's Jesus. The rest of us are all the villain. Because Haman, if you remember, he's the flesh. He's the flesh. He represents what your heart truly desires apart from God. And unless Jesus comes in and he fills your life and he changes your desires and he sets you on a new course, there is no hope for being anything other than the villain. Even the good that I would do apart from Jesus, it's not good. It's never going to earn me any kind of favor or respect before God. You see, the blood of Jesus is the only thing that has the power to change this. And it's faith in him that has the power to overcome the flesh. And yet, on this side of eternity, it's a constant struggle between the flesh and the spirit because the flesh is still present. For those who are not saved, if you're not in Christ, if you haven't given your life to Jesus, if you haven't asked him to be your Lord and your God and you've placed your faith in him for salvation, you have no other choice. There's only the flesh, only that which serves you and is for your glory. But once you give your life to Jesus, once you place your faith in him, we're told in 1 Corinthians that the Holy Spirit of God moves into your life, into your body, into your heart, and he takes up residence, literally living within you. And so now you have the Spirit of God that gives you all the the power and ability of, of the Lord to be able to overcome things in life, to be able to live a life that's honorable and full of integrity and full of glory before God but there's still that flesh that lives in there too. First, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter seven describes this. <clears throat> so I'm gonna put up a few of these verses and read through it with you. Um, there's a big section on this and so it was difficult to pick which verses we we're gonna do, but ver- we'll, we'll look at verses 21 through 25. I just wanna show you kind of what this says and, and, and realize something that's taking place here. It says, verse 21, I've discovered this principle of life that when I, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what's wrong. Anybody struggle with that? You ever have that? I know what's right. I know what I want to do. I know what's, what's appropriate. I know what God's calling me to. And then I find myself inevit- inevitably just going into what's wrong. That's when the flesh dominates. My self-will dominates my life. So I give over to it. I give into it. He, say, he continues, I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? If he stopped there, that would be a terrible verse, wouldn't it? No hope. Because when you read that, you see yourself. You go, yeah, that's me too. But he continues. There's more. He doesn't stop there. Because of the glorious power of the gospel of Jesus. He says, thank God. The answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, 
But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. And in that, there's this struggle that takes place. And what he's saying there is, and what he's illustrating for us there is that there is this opportunity to serve God, but it comes through submission to his spirit, not just work harder and try better. And that as I submit to the Holy Spirit of God, then he works in me the character of Christ. Haman states that he wants the king uh, to do this for him, or basically do this because that's what he wants. And that in this, he thinks what he thinks. My wife, my life revolves around me, and so your life revolves around me too. That Haman's desire, that the flesh is for his glory to be, to be proclaimed. And when we see all of this, we see very clearly that this is, I, I even wrote that in my Bible, I am Haman. That's, that is my flesh fully on display right there. But wait, there's more. Not only do we see God's plans and man's plans, but in verses 10 through 14, we see God's glory. Look at verse 10. It says this, Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robe and the horse, as you have suggested, and do so for Mordecai the Jew. Wouldn't you love to see his face in that moment, just like a close-up on his face? as he's Because, you know, it's like you just hear it coming out. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, let's do that. You, you make all the preparations for Mordecai the Jew. And, ah, you know. As Haman just screams in terror. All right. I told you I like movies. Who sits within the king's gate, leave nothing done of all that you have spoken. So Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and led him on horseback throughout the city square and proclaimed before him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. How terrible for that guy. Poor Haman. Uh, Verse 12, afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. When uh, When Haman told his wife, Zeresh, all that his friends, oh, excuse me, has told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. And while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. And so this one thing on top of another, and he's not even able to process, and it's like, all right, let's go. You got to go to the next banquet. Oh, man. God is surely setting some things up. Now, as we read there in verses 10 through 11, as all this begins to unfold, as the, the king says to do this to, uh, to Mordecai, uh, I'm sure that Haman is just mortified. Uh, that this is the absolute worst case scenario. He came in with the intent of saying, let's murder Mordecai. And then he's got an opportunity for his own honor and glory. And the whole thing gets turned on his head. And now he gets to be the, the official, right? Remember how he said, choose one of your most noble princes to go and lead him. He's, he's like, choose one of my subordinates to go and say all the awesome stuff about me. And now he gets to be the official who leads Mordecai, the guy he hates, through the city square and proclaim his awesomeness. Wow, that's crazy. You couldn't make this stuff up. This is amazing what's taking place here, that God is, is putting all these things together. That, that it, it's, it's just it's crazy and it's just funny. You know, you look at it and you go, that's funny. And I'm able to laugh and chuckle until I realize, wait, I'm Haman. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> you see... In Proverbs 27, 2, it says this. It says, let someone else praise you, not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Haman was worried about his own glory and he was worried about proclaiming his own awesomeness. Mordecai, he's not looking for this at all. We don't see him once asking for any kind of glory, any kind of honor, any kind of splendor. You see how they're set in, in juxtaposition against one another? That they're contrasting one another? That, that Haman the flesh and just living after his own desires and Mordecai living a life after the Spirit of God just submitted to whatever God wants to do. Not even looking for his own stuff. Not even looking to honor himself. It's, weird, it's really strange and interesting here in, in verse, verse 12. You see this, not only this uh, uh, contrast, but you see that there are, there, the posture of these two men are really very, very different. Notice what it says there in verse 12. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. 
So, so Mordecai, you know, he's, he, that's his job, right? He works at the king's gate. So he's there working at the king's gate, and uh, in walks Haman, and there's all this tension, right? Because every time Mordecai sh- sh- is there and Haman shows up, Haman's just spewing hate, and it's like daggers coming out of his eyes at him, and he's just looking for an opportunity to take him down. And there's all this tension, and then Haman walks up to Mordecai. I don't know what he said. Maybe like, hey, come with me. <laughs> okay. And so he goes with him, and then now he's, Haman's putting a kingly robe upon him and putting him on one of the king's horses, and I'm sure he's like, what in the world is going on? And now he's being led around through the city square as Haman is proclaiming how great he is. Uh, and, and I look at that, and I go, this is crazy. I mean, think about what, Mo- what Mordecai is experiencing in this moment and how weird this must feel for him and how out of left field this was. He's just kind of doing his thing, going through his normal life, just kind of living the way that he lived. And notice what he does afterward. He just goes back to work. He's, he's, he, just, he just goes back to work. Some people are like this. Some people are, are, are just like this. They don't want any public kind of recognition. They don't want to they don't want to be in front of people. They, they don't like that whatsoever. They, they don't, they're not doing what they do in order to receive glory for themselves. They're not seeking their own honor. And, and it seems as though Mordecai didn't even really want all of this because he just goes back to work. And God uses people in mighty and powerful ways in these behind-the-scenes behind the things. That it's not public. It's not in front of people. That, that no one really even knows what they do. And we have lots of servants like that within our church. That there are tons of people who are constantly at work serving you in ways that you don't even know. And they would hate it if I started recounting to you all the things that they did. Because they don't want you to know. They just want to serve God. And in this, God is is using them for the benefit of others. And the question I want to ask you this morning is, are you content with knowing that God knows? Is that enough for you? Are you content with knowing that God knows? Will you be satisfied with that? Or do you have to have accolades? If if somebody doesn't say thank you, if somebody doesn't pat you on the back, if somebody doesn't give you some sort of reward, if you don't have, you know, 50 gold stars next to your name on the the chart over there, then you're just going to lose your mind. How, How are you working in this situation? Do you need some sort of position or public praise? Or are you content with knowing that God knows? Uh, that's, that's the way Haman's, uh, or excuse me, Mordecai is, is acting in all of this. Now, Haman, completely different. Look at verse 12. It says, But Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. This is, this is a funeral position. The posture that he's in is in a mourning funeral position. His head is covered. He's, he's mourning. He's weeping. And that in this, the, the thing that he is mourning is the death of his pride. That he's built himself up so much and he's, he's recounted his glory so much and now everything comes crashing down right before him. And he's, he's left with this position of mourning. James 4.10 says this, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. In this I see a choice. I can choose to humble myself or I can let God humble me. Either I can take Mordecai's position and humble myself, and when God wants to to honor me, then it'll be right because I won't even think it's because of me. I'll realize this is God's fault anyway. And so I'll just reflect all that glory right to him. Or I can take the position of Haman, and I can try to exalt myself. And as I exalt myself, remember last week, God opposes the proud. He's at war with the proud. And that war is to bring humility into your life. And that in this, if you're like Haman, then you'll be humbled by God. And that usually is a humiliating experience. You can humble yourself or experience a humiliation the way that Haman is here. Completely humiliated before all the people that he's been building himself himself up before. Haman's wife and his friends, in verse 13, they, they flip on him. Notice that in verse 13? They were the ones just one chapter before saying, Go get him! Here's the plan. Let's build this giant pole and stab Mordecai on it. And now all of a sudden they're like, no, dude, you're you're done. Sorry, bro. (laughs) Notice what it says there uh, in verse 13. If Mordecai, before whom uh, you have begun to fall, they they see something. 
You're, this is the beginning of your falling before him. They're able to kind of, in the middle of all this, see all of these things. Now, Haman's kind of a superstitious guy. Remember when he was deciding when he was going to kill all the Jews? He's like rolling dice to figure out when that was going to happen. And all of his friends are superstitious, and they start seeing these things come together. And, and so they're able to sort of see some sort of spiritual thing taking place. They didn't recognize it as God. I mean, Haman still moves forward with his whole plan. I think this is an opportunity for repentance for Haman. I think this is God graciously reaching out to him and saying, hey, stop. This road only leads, in your, leads down the, the path to your death. But you could stop. You could turn around. You could repent. And I think God's reaching out to him, but he's so bent on his own thing and he can't see past himself. And so he doesn't see what God's doing. And so his wife and friends, they kind of see something taking place here. And so they, they flip on him because they see what he can't. And although Haman is bent on Mordecai's destruction, what he's really doing is he's actually fighting God, not Mordecai. He's actually fighting God. And because he's fighting God, he can't win. There's no chance for him to win. Uh, we're going to end here. And so uh, um, turn in your Bibles. We're going to end with a verse here. Um, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. I want to end with this section of Scripture just to kind of wrap all this together for us. And just to see how God shows himself strong and faithful on our behalf. To see how God's word actually tells us that no one can stand before us because they're not fighting you. When you place yourself in Christ and you in humility retreat into the Lord, it may look like they're fighting you. It may feel like they're fighting you, but they're actually fighting him. And if you let him fight for you, they can't win. They can't win. Look what it says in Romans 8, 31 through 39. Now, it's a big piece, and you're like, oh, man, here we go. Here's another hour. It's not going to be. We're just going to, I want to read it for the most part, make a couple of comments. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37, yet in all these things, what things, all of that stuff he just described, all that persecution and tribulation, and all the stuff that the, the world would look at and our flesh would tempt us to say, God's abandoned you. And all that, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's a, there's a lot that's being said here. And what I hope that just the reading of this does is it, it stirs your affections for Jesus. That you, you, le you read this and you clearly see Jesus loves me so much that he's willing to give himself for me. That the Father who loves me so much, He's willing to send His only Son to die on my behalf in order to buy me out of sin and death. And that if He loves me that much, that even the stuff that I would avoid in my life, even the, the things that come into my life that I look at and I go, those are not good things, God says, I'll still use it for my glory. I'll still use it to honor my name in your life. You see, you're more than a conqueror through Jesus because His love is for you. And this love is sure, it's certain, you can take it to the bank. Now, if I wrote you a million dollar check, that might make you happy. <coughs> until you went to go cash it. It's no good. It's not a good check. But when God writes you a check, man, you can take it to the bank. And when God says, I love you, and I am for you, and no one can come against you, because I will always work it out for my glory. Look, look at what it says that in verse, uh, verse 38. For I'm persuaded that death nor life, even in your death you can honor the Lord. 
Even if it costs you your life, it still can bring glory to God. He can still use it. And even if it does, and even if it's at the hand of the enemy, it's still for God's glory. And so God still wins. They don't win. It doesn't matter what they do when I'm hidden in Christ. You see, nothing can break or weaken the love of God. Absolutely nothing comes into your life except that either one, God brings it into your life, he causes it, or two, that he allows it. And when you look at life that way and you see that everything has come into my life, either that God has caused or allowed, that that he is sovereign over it all, nothing catches him by surprise, you're able to find a place of rest. You're able to find a place where it says, where you can say, God, you're so good. If he loves us, if he loves me enough to sacrifice his only son for me, and if Jesus is willing to go to the cross for me, then I should never doubt his love. Now, this doesn't mean you'll always feel loved. But when you don't feel what you should, that doesn't mean you don't do what you should. When you don't feel what you should, you still must believe what you should. Don't let your feelings tell you who you are. Look at verse 39 there. You are in Christ Jesus. And because of that, because of that, you're in the Beloved. You see, the difference in all of this is that God's people don't get to escape problems. The difference is the answer to the question, whose glory do I live for? Haman, in his pride, lived for his own glory. Mordecai, in humility, lived for God's glory. And that when I live for the glory of God, my confidence is in the love of Christ, and then I fulfill my life's purpose of bringing him glory. And that, that, which brings the most glory to God is always that which is most good for me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today, God, and the chance to just open your scriptures and look at them and study them together. And we pray that you would help us, Lord, to see how good you are, to see how glorious you really are, to, to, to really believe and trust and hope in you, that you really are as good as you say you are. We pray today, God, that um, you would help us to see the areas of life where I'm just like Haman, that my glory is my purpose, that my pride is what I'm looking to protect, that that I'm not looking to to cause my my flesh to be crucified with Christ. I'm, I'm I'm trying to protect it and coddle it and bring comfort to my flesh. Lord, forgive me. Help us to be willing to sacrifice those comforts that we long for in order to find peace and hope in you. And Lord, I just thank you so much for your great love for us. That Jesus, you were willing to give yourself for us, to buy us back, so that sin and death could no longer have reign over us, but that we might found, be found new in you. Lord, help us to honor you with our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.